right, everyone, and welcome back to yet another session recap. This time it is session 16 of the Grey Eminence campaign. So let's just dive in, shall we? Uh, I had actually intended the party to get a little bit further in this campaign. Uh, sorry, in this session, actually. But that is uh, just how D&D works. You plan for something and then you improvise what actually happens. And if I was to show you guys my notes, the notes that I had for this session really was about two bar paragraphs. And that's uh, everything that I had initially planned. Well, sorry, not initially planned, but that's what I had on the Lizard Folk tribe. And I came up the whole Yurik exchange um, right before the session. Uh, there, there, there's gonna, there's a small little subplot there that's happening, and uh, we'll see how how far it goes. But yeah, so the players just wrapped up their council meeting, and they walked down the steps, and they intended to go to Ortuk, the treant. And on their way, they ran into Yurik, who seemed a little off, and he was just kind of, uh, yeah. And so why should I care about you? He's very down and just kind of unmotivated like this. Uh, you know, that. But he is accompanied by a, a little pixie whose name is Fickle. And essentially, he says that the Fickle found some ruins off to the north of their borders and that uh, there's some type of mithril adamantine alloy, so to speak. Now, there's no real alloy of this in D&D as far as I know. It's just something I made up and, uh, you know, every little campaign has some made up rule that they have. And in this case, the old age, the wonder sage, as uh, I've written down in my world building notes, was full of uh, wonder, just as it sounds, right? And this just so happens to be one way that it was wondrous. They were able to make magnificent alloys of various metals. And uh, not all of it has survived. Uh, in fact, the way that they uh, do this is actually lost. But regardless, they found a, or at least the Fickle found a sarcophagus in the ruins with some engravings on it of this alloy. Now, why they were there, what they were doing up there, or what Fickle was doing up there, that's a different story which will be revealed a little bit later. Um, this is not just something that wasn't thought out even though I came up with it a little bit before the session. I can't quite tell you guys this, tell you guys anything about it yet. Um, so I'll wait until the players go into it. Anyways, they basically say, the party does, to Yurik that they have business to attend to, but they'll be back and then they can go on their little quest. And uh, so the players set off towards Ortuk, who basically says that this is uh, unnatural, but is kind of naive in the way of thinking that if a treant did indeed give Aenos or Alexander this mark in his arm, then it cannot be an evil mark, even though he senses evil about it. And eventually he comes to the conclusion that it might be some sort of blood magic. Um, Ortuk is very old and he knows a little bit about the ways of the past. He doesn't know how to accomplish them, but he just knows about them. So really they, it was kind of a dead end and they decide to go towards the lizard folk area. Now this was initially a all out battle, right? It, or at least it was going to be a surprise attack in the swamp area, which uh, happened, kind of. Um, and then hopefully the players either defeat those or they get captured. Now, the reason for this is I wanted to weaken the party a little bit by spending some spell slots and such and such, which I kind of did. Well, actually, I think Thaumaturge is just a, it's either a first level spell or it's a cantrip. I can't really remember. But anyways, Doug's character, Green, he used command word and had them surrender after basically a full round of everyone's trying to really intimidate these lizard folk. They went into the uh, situation as diplomats, which is kind of interesting. But to reward their tact, uh, instead of just outright slaying these beasts, which uh, was what I thought they would be, and the lizard folk being, at least this tribe, a warrior caste system would have been totally fine with that now. Um, 
and that was actually something I had set up for later. But instead, they were escorted to Marka. Now, Marka is essentially five times the warrior of anyone of of a basic lizard folk, and the lizard folk elites. They're elite warriors. There's about five of them, I think, are about two or three times uh, as tough as a normal lizard folk. Now, there was about 18 lizard folk overall in this village, and that is uh, with the scouting party uh, still alive. So they're walking up there, and they see Marka. They're introduced to her. Uh, they leave their weapons at the bridge, as said, and Marka is just very boastful and they see weakness they hunt it out okay they they really root out weakness and if anyone shows any bowing to the whims or deferment to them then they think they have power over them and become even more boastful now i did give alexander's player uh, john well i gave alexander the hint of this and it, it was a big group discussion essentially and i think it really went well. It was a great role-playing effort, uh, but it, it's hard to calmly dissect the information that you're given in a tense conversation with someone who's looking down on you because you already bowed to their whim of leave your weapons at the door. On top of all this, everything that they're saying about the hags, these lizard folk were warring with the hags earlier, and the hags got wiped out. And then the earth shook, and the lizard folk, at the time, Markal was looking at this uh, marble sculpture or statue of a monkey uh, that her grandfather raided from a human about 100 years ago or so. She claims that it spoke to her, and they started a whole little religion saying Moanki, which is actually just the name I came up with uh, on the top, off the top of my head, uh, if you can't tell, but... It, it served its purpose. Uh, I was just going to call it monkey initially, but Moanki sounds a little bit better and sounds like something simple tribes people might do in such a event because mountains rose up and this was at the time that Fell touched the gem and then the lizard folk went and checked out the hag village, which they found completely destroyed by a powerful force. Marka thought it was... Uh, Moanki, or at least she wanted other people to believe that so she could control this village. So Atlas is over there trying to debate with her saying, oh yeah, we are the ones that killed the hags and all this is because of us. And she's like, you dare say that in front of Moanki right here, who's basically by now raised up on this column of mud that's reinforced with twigs and stuff. And uh, they're not getting through. And eventually things break down. Uh, they they really only break down because Atlas went off to his weapons suddenly. Of course, of course, this is something that might be expected because this person was just saying that you bowed to their whims, blah, 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 blah. Oh, and now there's a village. You're telling me that you have lands, you have a town around here. Well, we are not held by any boundaries as you may want us to be. And Atlas did not take that very well. And there's not much else I could have done at that moment. Now, what I was going to do was kind of lure them into a trial by combat situation. But again, the players don't know this information. They want to try and get the jump on them. Um, and, and it maybe almost worked. Uh, but the players, everyone else, the slower people, were away from the weapons. And half the battle was them getting to their weapons. And then Greem died. And it was just a big clusterfuck. Now, it would have been slightly easier had they wiped out that initial scouting party well actually now that i think about it that initial scouting party was almost all that was there they could have really focused their attacks on the first couple uh lizard folk elite and marka and the shaman and it would have taken again three rounds before anyone else could have got there so they would have been a lot better off now i don't know if the outcome would have been the same or if they would have gotten unlucky in rolls you, you just never know on that part but at that moment that Atlas ran away, the whole setting up a trial by combat to see what happens was kind of a moot point. Although I did want them to find another land or lair for the lizard folk. That was going to be the agreement. They, if 
let's say Alexander won the battle against Marka, then Marka and her tribe would agree to let the players relocate them, but the players would have to find a good spot for the lizard folk themselves. So it wouldn't have just been a, a cure all. The lizard folk would still live in the swamps for a little while and they might cause mischief. Overall, though, I thought the whole battle went uh, really well. It was a pretty epic battle for only against the village of lizard folk. Now, the guerrilla tactics that Atlas and Fell pulled out at the end is really what saved the party. If they had stayed, the party would have been wiped. Now, granted, I probably would have um, kept some of them alive, as in stabilized, um, and maybe had them try to break out as a sacrifice, or they may have truly died. I don't really know what I would have done in that moment. Because if Fell, Atlas, or Alexander fall while the contract is still in play, their souls are forfeit. They cannot be revived, no matter what. Now, Green did die, and I tried to make it as cinematic as possible with in the battle. He saw Valhalla, and he saw the halls of his forebears and all this, and I thought it was pretty cool. I had a good time telling that, and uh, it wasn't exactly a freebie. And I told Doug as much, which Doug's played with me for a while. He, he knows I don't want anyone to really die, but if you deserve to die, you will die. Now, he saw Moradin, and now he owes Moradin a favor. And not just like, oh yeah, you owe me this. It's a call that he is honor bound, duty bound to answer. And hopefully the party recognizes this and may set up for a nice little subplot later on down the line. Maybe with some magical items, things of that nature. So I, I haven't really given it too much thought yet. Um, they're just in the start of chapter two, kind of act one. They're almost about to get to Act 2 in probably about two sessions, I would say, is the start of it. Whenever they leave the lands for a certain somebody, uh, not the whole ruins thing, but perhaps I've said too much on that. Needless to say, Act 2 is going to be very interesting and a lot more focused on combat and adventuring. Um, you might say, oh, well, the first chapter was based on adventuring. Yeah, it kind of was, but this is going to be more direction focused. Chapter one was a lot like, oh, we have a big swath of land. Let's adventure here. Blah, 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 blah. Oh, wyverns. Oh, hippogriffs. Blah, 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 blah. Which, uh, I have not forgotten about them or the one that Danner healed. So if any of you out there are wondering about that, do not worry. After the battle, uh, the session pretty much ended. I leveled him up to level 9. I know I said I didn't want to really rush the leveling system, but level 9 is where they really need to be right now. They're going to start facing some really big challenges. I think the whole level 8 to level 12 or 13 is really one of the hardest parts of the game because you're starting to face monsters that are unlike anything you've faced before. They have legendary actions, some of them may, and they have sometimes three attacks or four. Uh, they have really crazy spell casting. And so level nine is where I need them to be, but I also want them to feel a little hopeless for a little while. And I do have plans for them to be level 12 by the end of chapter two. Now, I think I'm going to really delay levels um, 10 and 11, but once I hit levels 11, I think... I'll grant level 12 in like two sessions after that. Maybe. I'm not quite sure. We'll see how it goes. I might do it the reverse way and might make them level up to level 10 real fast and make the track from levels 10 to 11 real slow and then 11 to 12 real slow. We'll see how that goes. So the stuff that didn't get covered in this session was the whole Dryad Grove thing, which is kind of sad because uh, that really kind of starts planting some seeds for Act 2 of this chapter. And Act 3, really. I haven't really drawn a distinct line where Act 2 and Act 3 ends and begins. But we'll see. I need to do a little bit more writing on that. But anyways, the dry Grove thing, I was really bummed that they didn't get to see it. Mainly because I uh, drew a map. And it took me all week. It took about 
I'd say eight hours, maybe slightly a bit less to draw this map. And keep in mind, I am not a professional drawer by any means. So it is, uh, it, it's one of my better works because I mainly did caverns and interiors. And that is kind of child's play when it comes to nature. So this features more grass, uh, basically a lot of shit ton of grass and I got some uh, pointers which I won't really implement in this map but I'll use going forward and I don't really want to share the map yet but if you have browsed the subreddit battle maps you have possibly seen it already but anyways when we do play that session that the Dryad Grove is involved in which is looking to be the 19th of this February possibly right now um, then I will post it at the end of the session and on Facebook and uh, maybe on Twitter too, but I'll just post it all around so you can use it for your own. And keep in mind the color scheme, it's a little vivid, which I kind of like, but I understand what people were saying when they were giving me some criticisms about it. The the colors are a little bit too vivid. So I, I toned them down a little bit and they're still pretty vivid even after the fact. But I, I'm mostly done with the map. I'm not really working on it too much because I finished it and I feel happy with it. And I kind of want to leave it as a benchmark so I can come back in a couple months and look at it and be like, oh, yeah, yeah, that looks like shit. Or Hey, that wasn't so bad, but look how much I've improved this area. But anyways, I'm getting away from the whole session thing. Um, what's to look forward to, though? The next session looks to be Dried Grove uh, based. We'll see how that diplomatic exchange goes. And and also, Ortuk might meet Sertan. I'm not sure how that's going to work. Uh, Sertan might just refuse because there's something about Sertan that's not quite there if you haven't already figured it out yet. And then off to the ruins, probably, if Atlas wants to get himself some armor. Now, that sub-arc is going to be a little tricky. Actually, I think I'll stop right there. I just recorded a whole little segment on the ruins bit and the armor, but I think I'm going to wait and let you guys see the session first and let the players encounter it and then I'll talk about it. So that wraps up this session recap. Again, thanks for everyone for watching. I'm getting a little bit more comments. I like that because I like to just see that community engagement. So again, thanks for watching this video and please like, subscribe, and comment down below. Take care, everyone.